this is where we now have come to the point of having a systematic way, a discipline called medical ethics. Because as I said earlier, in 1900, you didn't have to wrestle with these questions because you didn't have anything anyway that you had to sort out. Uh, if I had somebody in a life-threatening situation, as I said, we would very naturally say to the medical professional, to the doctor, do anything and everything you can. Well, didn't really have a whole lot. But I think we're going to be very reluctant in this day and age to tell a doctor, do anything and everything you can, spare nothing whatsoever. Maybe initially, but in the long term, we're still going to have to say, when do we stop this? When is enough enough? And even when you talk about the Hippocratic Oath, what that basically says, I'll sum it up real quickly, good, sincere people, people of virtue will do the right thing. Well, we all know sincerity is not enough, is it? I've seen some very, very dangerous things done by sincere people. So you've got an individual who's very sincere, who's got my best interest at heart, my heart's not working well, and because this is a sincere person, it says, go operate on my heart. Well, I don't think so. I want to have someone who's got some skills, some knowledge, some education. I'd like to really have somebody who knows the ins and outs of coronary surgery, and then we'll go with that. So the same thing here with regard to the complexity of modern medicine. Sincerity isn't going to cut it. Only sincerity. Well, you would hope practitioners are sincere people. They can take as many Hippocratic oaths as they want about doing the right thing. It doesn't necessarily automatically translate to the right thing. So we do need a very disciplined, systematic uh, way of sorting out these complex questions. And again, that's medical ethics. When you're looking at those principles, they're called in the, in, I guess in your language you call it prima, we call it prima in, in the Latin, prima facie principles. These are self-evident principles. And the way I often like to uh, illustrate that is, so here I am and I'm not feeling well, and I make an appointment with my doctor, and what do I want my doctor to do? I'm not feeling well, I want the doctor to make things, we would say better, that's self-evident. So we're not going to say, I want the doctor to make things worse. That would be nonsense. We want to have a benefit. We want the doctor to make things better. But the thing about it is, there is no medical intervention that doesn't have an up and a downside, a risk and a reward, a benefit and a burden. We've got to start weighing. Here's what's going on. Here's the intervention. Will the side effects be so burdensome that I can't expect a benefit? Or will the benefit outweigh the bad stuff? constant back and forth on that kind of issue, that kind of question. With regard then to the intervention, what if the side effects outweigh it? We have also a principle, primum non nocere. Translates, first of all, don't do harm, but every intervention does harm. So it does come down to a very, very difficult kind of question, issue to sort out. And uh, when, when I talk about the very first principle then, Patient well-being has to lead it all. And the fancy word for that in the principles, the ethical textbook, beneficence. Bonus, good, fortuary to do, bene, the adverb form. We want to do good. We want to have a benefit come out of that. And doctors then also take an oath that they are going to be a person who is going to make sure that that happens. So first of all, don't do harm. Yeah, good point. But there is going to be harm done. Painful wrestling again going on with regard to that kind of question. <clears throat> so as, as we look at that, the flip side of the uh, don't do harm is non-maleficence. Don't make it worse. Don't make that worse. So again, what you asked me earlier was, circumstances will determine which way the individual will go. Were they going to do the necessary things that will enhance my knowing, loving, serving, continue to carry out the purpose of our human existence, or will it get in the way? So when we're looking at proportionality, benefit, burden, determining the right thing to do, that's in my hands to a certain extent, which then would lead to the very next ethical principle. Who determines Tom's well-being? Well, we often say, well, the doctor does. No, I think it's in the patient's hands. 
So patient well-being is the first goal, beneficence. The second goal would be patient self-determination, and the fancy word for that is autonomy. Greek word there, auto self, nomos, norm, or guide. That I get to be the norm or guide determining that. So a doctor can give me all the situation, give me an overview, this is what's happening to you, Tom, this is the extent of your injury, this is what a disease is, this is what we can do, and then clearly lay out for me all that's involved. And then I am the one, ultimately, who still has to make that decision. And for me to make a good decision, what do I have to have? Weaving in a legal again here, I need to have information. Before any medical professional can do an intervention, particularly something invasive, they need my permission. But I have to be able to get good information to weigh that. Informed consent is a very strong legal term, isn't it? Informed consent, and the two words are important. Information, proper information to give good consent. And it's been shown in the court of law, I can quote case history here, but I'll be brief for, for the sake of this tape here, that where it has been shown that this individual went through a procedure, they had adverse outcomes, and then were able to prove in court that they didn't really get the necessary information to give proper legal consent for that. And the practitioner has lost in those cases. I'll give you a gruesome one that I uh, had an ethicist I was working with out of St. Louis was sharing this. Situation where a woman presented the child in grave situation to the emergency room. Despite the best efforts of the practitioners, the child died. The doctor, be kind, came out and told the mother, I'm sorry your child didn't make it. We don't know what's going on. We need to do an autopsy. We need your consent for that. So the mother signed on the dotted line, left the hospital, wasn't unduly emotionally distressed, came back the next day and asked, did my child make it through the autopsy okay? Everybody knows what the word autopsy means, right? Now, probably were two situations going on with regard to that. Number one, it could have been she wasn't given the information clearly. And secondly, under what kind of emotional situation was she in? A lot of emotional distress. And none of us makes good decisions when we're really under the gun emotionally. So in terms of patient self-determination, making the final decision, do or not do, We've got to get the necessary information. Even when I get consulted ethically for situations, I always want to know, give me clearly what's going on clinically here so I can give you the best advice. I don't make the decision. The practitioner still has to make the decision. But I want to make sure I understand the underlying issues that will lead to the decision that's most properly in place with this particular situation. So yes, autonomy and beneficence very closely go hand in hand here. They very closely go together. Usually the committee will meet and the family might be there, not always, so that yes, you want to very, very clearly make to the family, clearly make known what's going on. And they will also be under a lot of emotional distress. They don't necessarily, and, and shouldn't, saying goodbye to someone near and dear is always very, very difficult. And what I also strongly advise, this also gets to be a grief loss issue. So you've got to bring in the dynamics of bereavement here. And I will strongly suggest, if the doctor hasn't done it because they may want to get so caught up in the technical language, which by the way, I don't find very difficult because I have so much Latin and Greek. And basically when the doctor's talking to a patient who hasn't had, it's Greek to them because it is Greek. Well, I can easily go through the words and understand. And so I often suggest, let's get a chaplain or a social worker to visit with the family also about this situation and make sure that that individual properly understands the underlying medical, clinical issues going on. What, to what age could a woman expect to live born in 1900? 48. How often do we lose decisional capacity at 48? Not too often, but it happens. You know, the young cases that we uh, have signed, the high-profile cases that went to the court. But living into the 80s and 90s and 100, 
very likely that we lose sensational capacity. So now who determines Tom's well-being? I've lost my ability to decide. This was a real vacuum for a long time. And those high-profile cases, I believe we'll talk about them a little bit later, almost invariably had to do with no recourse to decisional making, decision making here. What the legislators finally decided in the various states was we need to have an instrument, a legal tool, whereby we hand over legally now the ability to decide to direct the medical care. Those are called advanced directives. And here in Kansas, we have three instruments whereby this is handed on to someone else. The first one legislated in 1979 is called the Living Will Declaration, where it, what it says, I declare that in the event that two doctors certify that I'm not going to benefit from medical intervention, it'll simply, simply prolong the dying rather than enhance the living, the knowing, loving, serving. I don't want my dying prolonged, a declaration. And that's simply that. Often it led to conflict and this and that. So what was determined was a stronger legal document was needed. So in 1989, the Kansas legislature passed what is called the Durable Power of Attorney Statute. So that I now can give someone the legal authority in the event I have lost decisional capacity to direct my care, get the same information from the doctor that I would have, and out of that context, make the decision of, is it now going to benefit or is it going to be a burden? Again, determining when enough is enough here. So I am the principal. I can name someone else as my power of attorney, my agent. But again, be careful, as I illustrated with that kidney patient, be careful about the agent you choose. That it can be basically anyone, but it cannot be the medical provider to start off with. Usually people name a family member, spouses name each other, which is fine, except for the fact that if the spouses are traveling together, and they both get incapacitated, then it's in limbo again. What the, we in, advise very strongly when I say we, those of us who work in this field, is that you name your primary, and then you can name as many alternates as you want. So that if the primary is unable or unwilling, then it moves on to the alternates that have been named. And I also advise that people quick, uh, uh, quickly ask, can I name an agent both for medical care and for my financial affairs? I said, well, you can. I use myself as an illustration. If you name me as your medical power of attorney, I know the ins and outs. I know how to weigh things. Probably a good decision. If you name me as your financial power of attorney, bad choice. I'll spend all your money on hunting and fishing. Oh, teasing around a little bit. But I don't know finances in and out like I do the medical. So it, it would be wise maybe to choose those people who are going to be very easily able to direct either one, medical or financial. Again, a quick illustration of an individual who approached me. Her mother had had a severe stroke. And she had often had conversations with her one daughter that she didn't want to have her dying for long, tied up with tubes and this and that, simply existing vitalism. So she did have a fun, uh, stroke and, and was incapacitated, couldn't speak, but was aware. And the daughter was just going to say, let, let it be. But she had a son who insisted that everything be done, full bore. He was also an attorney. And so that got the attention of the medical community again. But my friend said every time she walked into her mother's room on a long-term care facility, she could see the anger come from her eyes. Eventually, she did die. And then she came to me and says, I don't want that happening to me. So I want to have the tools. So I explained to her, the adorable power of attorney, she had seven children. And now she had to decide which one of the seven, her husband had died, was she going to choose? And so I let her go on through, could see on her face she was going through the seven. She finally picked one of her daughters. And I thought, well, why, why this particular one? She says, she's the least emotionally attached to me. And she can probably make a better objective decision about to do or not to do. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Choose your agent carefully is how I started this discussion. 
The third one is one I actually went to Topeka and lobbied against. Uh, it's called the out-of-hospital DNR. Let me preface this also by saying I differentiate between advanced directives and medical directives. People often ask me, well, can I put in there, I don't want this or I want that. I ask, where do you start and where do you stop when it comes to the medical interventions available today? You gotta write volumes. You gotta write books to cover every medical intervention, whether you do or don't. Why don't you simply put in there, which is what I did in mine, that you clearly are authorizing your agent to evaluate the situation, and then out of that context, make the decision about whatever medical intervention is being offered. That's, that's what I advise. So when it comes to the third one, it, it was called the out-of-hospital DNR. It said, this is a medical intervention. Why do you want to have legislation to cover that? It depends on the circumstance. For example, in Harry Hines Hospice, we'll go over that particular point about resuscitation or not, the DNR or not having it. And some patients, we don't, some hospices say, you cannot be in our program unless you have a DNR. We don't have that. But we want to know, why do you want to have CPR attempted? I keep always saying attempted. Well, for this and that. So we look at that as a particular intervention. Why do you want to have it in advanced directive? Why would I want to say right now, Dr. Sandy never attempt resuscitation? I don't know the circumstances I may encounter down the road. But once my doctor says, Tom, you've got this terminal cancer, then I may want to go the right of a doctor writing for me a do not resuscitate order. So I think it causes more problems than it solves, is, was my estimation, but we work with it as best we can. We use it as an educational tool in our program to kind of explain to people and then let them decide in the event of cardiac or pulmonary uh, situations that arise that, that crisis. Then we'll make a decision regarding where you want to go with it. You can say do everything or don't do everything. It's a neutral document. Those documents that are part of the statutes do not dictate the values that we were talking about earlier. And the Catholic Conference in Kansas actually has one that comes out where you can start dictating different medical interventions. The one I used was the Kansas statutory form. And I simply put in my form when it comes to those basic interventions, we, we call life support, I really prefer almost body support, in terms of pulmonary, cardiac, renal, and nutritional, that my agent now evaluates what's been going on from the information given. And then I said, clearly that agent I have named and my alternates are authorized to make decision regarding do or not do regarding those particular issues. Number one, it's a gift to yourself that it will probably prevent interventions that you would consider futile and burdensome. So it's a gift to yourself. It's a gift to your family. I do not, I can't begin to give you the number of people who have anguished and anguished, like my friend regarding her mother's situation, about should we or should we not? And then the fighting within the families. Oh my, you want me to write a book on that one? Where you've got, say, 10 children. Five say, do everything. And then five says, don't do anything. Now what? No written advance directives, nothing at all to give a sense of direction. <clears throat> where they would come from in terms of their value system, their conscience, that part of that three-legged stool. So it's a gift to the family too. We've also had where situations where we've taken someone under care where the children weren't all on the same page, where fortunately the parent had named one of the children an agent or named somebody else. So when the other family members kept coming at us, keep doing this or that, we would have recourse and say, you've got to speak to this person. Legally, we have to follow the direction to that person. So a gift to yourself, a gift to your loved ones, your family, and it's a gift to the medical community. Medical professionals, I can tell you, do not appreciate being pushed into a corner where they're pushed to do what they consider futile care and violating themselves, their personal integrity morally, and violating themselves as a professional ethically. But then they've got that legal part that pushes them to have to follow whatever somebody says, that they say, consider this is, this is nonsense, this is futile, this is, this is doing more harm than good. A popular way of saying beneficence is medical professionals want to do things for people. They don't want to do things to people. And let's face it, 
in some instances, medical interventions are doing things to people, not for.